new day, new experience where we can have a refreshed encounter with the Holy Spirit. For those who are joining us online, we say thank you. We say like, share the page, and invite your friends, family members, even your co-workers, and let them know that we are on at this time. This morning we have with us two distinguished gentlemen. They are pastors by profession. They are both JG. They are both left-handed. They are both ministers of the gospel. So there are so many similarities about them. Of course, they're not the same age. They don't necessarily look the same. One has more hair on the face, while the other has less. But let's hear more from them. So they're going to tell us which JG they are. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Lyons, for your warm introduction. Uh, my name is Jamie Gordon. I'm a student of life. I love to enjoy the journey, and uh, I look forward to the discussion that we have here this morning. Check. Yeah, my name is Jerome Gordon, and I am the pastor of the Southern District of Seventh-day Adventist churches in beautiful, salubrious Grenada. And of course, I am here to share with us this morning on this very interesting um, topic that I think is germane in our day and time. All right. And of course, they did not go deep, but allow me to take a minute, Pastor Jamie Gordon, for those who missed it before, is the newly elected youth director of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, he's also responsible for personal public campus ministries. Yeah, public campus ministries. Pastor Jerome Gordon is responsible for personal ministries and uh, Sabbath school and community services. Sabbath school too? All right, very nice. So I just wanted him to say that. So he's responsible for personal ministries, Sabbath school, and community services. So when you have any challenge within any of those areas there, now they are the men to call, and they are leading two important army of both youth and, I would say, the laity, so the JGs are running nice in Jesus' name. As we continue, I invite you to bow your heads with me as Pastor Gordon, Jerome Gordon, prays for us. Father, words in heaven, we are profoundly delighted to be here today. We thank you for the gift of life. We ask now that you will stimulate our brain cells as we talk about these issues that are indeed important for life and for Christian faith and spiritual development and growth. We pray that you'll bless our listening and viewing audience, bless our director, our chairperson, moderator, as he directs the flow of the discussion today. Be with my colleague, panelist, Pastor Jamie Gordon. May we have a good time in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. And of course, I am your host, Pastor Bernard Lyons. This morning, we are speaking about relativism in Christian dumb. And the first question that we have that we are going to give to our panelists is what is the relevance of relativism in the Christian context? What is the relevance of relativism in the Christian context? Well, um, relativism is about ethical behavior. It is one form of um, ethics. And as we, whenever we talk about ethics, we talk about what's right and what's wrong. So discussing relativism in the context of what's right, what's wrong, has implications for Christian behavior in our day and time. All right, very nice. Go ahead. Yes, um, um, well, I agree with Pastor Gordon. I think it's a, a very relative topic for, for the day and time. 
um, simply because we have so many denominations, so many school of thoughts, and uh, a lot of persons are searching for absolute truth, uh, maybe a direction that you know they can have trust and confidence in. And when you have so many different views and um, you know ideas on something, it's a bit confusing. And I believe that people are searching for something a bit more stable. So I would say that it's a very relevant topic. It's relevant also, Mr. Moderator, because when we look at the statistics, um, 70% of all Christian young people attending secular universities give up their faith in God and the scriptures by their sophomore year. It means that there is a form of aggressive um, ethical teaching that is corroding or eroding their biblical foundation. And so as, as a church, as pastors, we have to be concerned that we buttress the faith of our young people and give them the tools to understand the ethical theories that are out there. And relativism is one of the dominant ones. All right. So we spoke about the relevance of relativism. So let us break down relativism. Um, if I would res respond, um, a very simple answer. Um, basically, to each his own. In other words, your, thr your truth simply becomes what you choose to believe. So in other words, when we look at the word relativism, um, there are some root words there, relation or relate. And uh, I can simply describe it as different ways of relating to the same issue. So we have the, the issue of church, we have the, um, the issue of family, we have the issue of sex, drugs, alcohol, but relativism, there are different ways of relating to the same topic, and all of them can be held as true, because there are no absolute truths. Okay. Right, um, and to add to my colleague, Pastor Jamie Gordon's um, definition a while ago, ethical relativism is a theory that holds that morality is relative to the norms of one's culture. That is, um, whether an action is right or wrong depends on the, its, its societal context. So the same action may be morally right in one society or in one subgroup, but morally wrong in another subgroup. So it does not embrace an overarching principle. It sees morality as something that is situational. Okay. Is it contextual? You said situational. Is it contextual? Is it within a certain geographical location, confinement? Would you say that? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's relative to just about any group or subgroup. Pastor Jamie Gordon outlined a number of things, um, sexuality, um, family, whatever. It is saying that in any given, any given context, mm -hmm. what you regard as right is right in that context exclusively. But in another context, it may be wrong. So, um, yes, it is contextual in the sense that um, it, it views morality in terms of where you are geographically or philosophically. Okay. That, that's interesting. Go yeah. ahead, Pastor Jimmy. And uh, I'm just so, just so add, um, we, we are so enlightened now that even in one geographical setting, let's say, for example, in the church, if you do a survey of person's view on the drums, in that same culture, one would say, yes, the drum has a place. Another person may say, it invokes spirits. Um, if you ask um, on diet in the same church, some may choose to eat extremely, like just raw. Some may eat a, a blending of cooked and raw. Um, you, you look at parenting. In the same confine, um, people even now have relatively different thoughts, even though you're supposed to be of the same kind of culture or, or belief system. So I would say right now, how I see it, it goes from individual to individual rather than a space or culture now. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Let's follow on in this discussion because it seems as though we will get someplace. Well, second question based on the outline. Can you please help reconcile 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23? Matthew 7, 1, and Malachi 3, 6. So allow me to read them for you. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. For do I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Am I speaking truth? All right. Mm -hmm. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews yes. to them that are under the law as under 
the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Hmm. That I might gain them that are without law. <laughs> to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might be by all means save some. And verse 23 says, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. All right. Matthew 7, 1 says, Judge not that ye be not judged. And Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. That is indeed a mouthful. So can you reconcile? <laughs> um, I, I read the text and I <laughs> smiled to myself <laughs> because uh, it is so easy Mm -hmm. If you do just a casual reading, just um, a surface reading, to think that Paul was some um, emasculated um, um, opportunist who, like a chameleon, fits in whatever shape you put it in, and, and, and therefore he, he cannot be trusted because if you put him in a certain context, he, he identifies with them, and then that could have a kind of negative connotation mm -hmm. uh, if someone describes Paul as, as that. But if you look carefully, Paul is not dealing with uh, morality when you look at his adaptations to the va his various cultural adaptations. Okay. He's not. It's not. A, it's not like if he if he went to a culture where they are, they have plural wives. Then to, uh, he, <laughs> to, to win them to Christ, he gets three women to be with him, you know, uh, or a place where they use, let's say he went to um, Nine Miles Bull Bay, where there is a concentration of Rastafarians on the beautiful island of Jamaica, and they have a thing they call a trillum pipe. It's a kind of mechanism to smoke marijuana, strong, <laughs> sensimina. These guys don't know those words, you know, you have to forgive them. <laughs> And it's not like Paul would go there and get um, some marijuana and say, okay, I want to win these folks to Christ, so let me get high with them too. You cannot, it's not like, because he even points it out that, you know, he's under the law of Christ. Mm -hmm. So there are certain cultural trappings that are innocuous. If you go there and they like to drink carrot juice first thing in the morning, there's absolutely nothing that is ethically significant about cultural trappings. Uh, what type of, whether you want to wear a long flowing robe. I was in a communist country once preaching the gospel. And I became as much as I could, um, I don't say communist, no. I became <laughs> as much as I could in terms of, you know, what they ate, what they drank, you know. And I think that's what Paul is talking about. He's not being an opportunist and violating God's law from culture to culture. But he's observing whatever elements of the culture that he could without violating his conscience. Amen. Amen. Okay, go ahead, Pastor. G. Okay. God. Um, in looking at the three passages, um, we, we, we can get some singular points for each one of them. And I think starting with Malachi 3 and verse 6, we, we get the concept there that God does not change, but he's absolute. Mm -hmm. But although God does not change and he's absolute and he expects us to be unbending in principles, um, in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23, God also gives room for adaptability in our approach to rich people. And the word there, when Paul says, I became weak or I became as under the law, um, did not mean that he was converted but some synonyms are he acted like or he placed himself in their position or he lived like. And it's just like in missions. If you go to Africa, you go to some rural tribe, you may dress like the people to identify with the people, but to point them to the absolute truth. And uh, the last one is that we should not judge. So God does not change. We could be flexible in our approach, but in sharing the gospel, we should be careful not to judge um, and that word there for judge, it means to criticize or condemn. Because if God would have judged us when we needed him, then no one um, would have been saved. So God doesn't change, but we can be flexible and adaptable to the culture to introduce the gospel 
and we should always keep a humble spirit and not judge because God is not that sort of judgmental God when it comes to his people, but he will judge based on the choices that, that we would make. All right. Mm -hmm. I see Allison Ack says, that is a problem in our churches because people want to differentiate right and wrong based on area, culture, mm -hmm. diversity, and so on. But I say what Jesus say. Mm -hmm. Sin is to know right and to do, do and do wrong. All yeah. right. When we, when we think about what was just discussed in terms of relativism and uh, as you seek to reconcile the different passages we had before us, we, we see that individuals can, can cause preference mm -hmm. to, to interfere mm -hmm. with the way they see life. But what about the word called principle? Because there are some persons, to me, they mix up preference and principle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they, they mix up. You, have, you, you can choose. You have things where, like colors, you, you choose red, yellow, green. You have a choice in the matter in choosing. But then the principle steps in, and there is, no, there is not that choice where it's red, yellow, green. Can you walk that Pastor Jerome Garden? Well, you know, I, I, like, I like what you said because oftentimes we find people legislating on preferences. So we don't want the drums in the church because my style, I prefer a kind of quiet, cerebral, uh, non-excitable disposition among my praise and worship team. And so that's my preference. Now, if I get the church board to pass a, a law uh, saying that no drums should be there, nothing of the sort, then I am legislating a preference, mm -hmm. making it into um, a principle to guide the worship. Now, we need to be careful. We do this all the time. Something that's a preference, it's okay. It's your preference. But when you try to impose it on others, masquerading your pre pre preference as a principle, mm -hmm. That becomes problematic within any social setting. So we ought to make that qualitative distinction between preferences and, indeed, principles. Okay. So can we say that principle should be pushed into relativism? Or should there be a foundation so that we do not get lost when we, we delve into relativism? Well, relativism is the opposite of absolutism. All right. So absolutism mm -hmm. says that they are absolute moral principles that are unchanging. Uh, for example, thou shalt not murder is an absolute moral principle. Mm -hmm. It means thou shalt not murder in Grenada, thou shalt not murder in the U.S., thou shalt not murder in Africa, thou shalt not murder in, in, in Port of Spain, thou shalt not... Uh, Thou shalt not steal. It means thou shalt not steal when you have plenty of money. Thou shalt not steal when you're broke. Thou okay. shalt not steal at midnight. Thou shalt not steal at midday. These are overarching principles that are applicable in any circumstance or culture. That's what we believe as Christians. We believe in moral absolutism. So that cuts across the relativism that says it's sometimes right to do wrong. Go ahead. Yeah, um, there was just a comment there from Sister Allison. Um, she said, no, I will not adopt to culture to present the gospel. And further down, she says, I will continue to present the gospel without adapting to culture. Jesus didn't do that. Um, I don't know if the point was a little misconstrued, but the, the culture we're talking about um, is in line with Paul's approach um, in terms of acclimatizing to the, the daily lifestyle of the people. One of the biggest adapt adaptations I've seen is actually Jesus coming to earth. Mm -hmm. So he was divine, a spirit being, immortal, you know, omnipresent, all-powerful, but he was cloaked in humanity to identify with us. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if Christ came down on earth in his divine form, everybody dead. The, the gospel story would not make as much sense um, as if it did not, you know, make that kind of adaptation there. So I would say 
in in order to win um person's confidence or to be able to identify with them and they identify with us um sometimes there is a level of sameness and similarity that is necessary now imagine you're, you're going um in a rural tribe and you're preaching a gos the gospel and you have your shirt and your tie in your neck and everybody else in some dashiki you you look very strange um they would they would say nah this is not one of us they might not even trust you but if they see that you are willing to come down to the level and um, even learn the language that, that's the kind of adaptations we, we're talking about there you speak the language you you know if you have to bathe in the river you're bathing the river too you you eat fruits uh, as opposed to the western diet but you the people feel that you are a part of them so it's not compromising the principle as you mentioned you know but there is a preference there in terms of how they live so that that, that that's what we, we we're speaking about there i guess the only challenge that would come is when they walk around naked, I doubt you take out your clothes and walk. Well, naked. we don't do that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and, and it, it makes a point, Mr. Moderator, that um, even in our adaptations, we are still guided by certain overarching principles. Uh, Amen. 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 So we, we, we can adapt, but it's it is it is it is within our, within a certain confine. Good. Because Amen. Amen. to make our discussion relevant in terms of relativism and the the absolutes and so on, we come in we come in deeper into that. But with what is taking place with, with Israel and Hamas and so forth, and uh, you hear statements like, these are casualties of war. Yeah. So that whole human rights <laughs> aspect of things becomes blurred within certain contexts. And yes, so yes, yes. whereas the death of an individual will be something that is so important to the minds of others within a certain context, it is just simply casualties of true, war. True, true. And, and that is a very poor justification because oftentimes wars are fought because of the egos of politicians or people with power. So I don't like Jamie Garden's country, and I think that some um, 200 years ago I used to own a part of it. So now mm. I have nuclear weapons, so I send my soldiers over. Wars are oftentimes, the reasons for war are oftentimes um, unjust and egotistical. So you cannot therefore use war to justify creating casualties and killing in the name of your country because the war itself may be immoral. <laughs> so, so, what, right. what, so what if Pastor Lyon and somebody go to the Bible now and they were saying when Israel was in war with the Philistines and some of the Israelites died, um, how did God consider that? <laughs> Were the casualties of war? <laughs> was it considered as a as a necessary evil? Um, so I guess that's why we have a discussion today. You know, very yeah. very interested. So the fact that they yeah. have been unjust and immoral wars does not say they weren't just wars. Yeah. Because if God sent an army, then God being the epitome of justice and morality, then His word is law and His word is justifiable. Yeah, very nice, and of course. That, that would be seen that way as we speak about relativism mm -hmm. in the eyes of the one who accepts Christianity yeah. and accepts Christ as the ultimate being, guide, and superior force in this universe. So another individual who does not accept Christ will absolutely not accept that whole aspect of it's justified because it's Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So relativism is indeed a relevant topic. And let's continue with our discussion. Yeah, yeah. Question four says, how do Christian teachings on moral absolute, such as the Ten Commandments, relate to the idea of relativism? Well, the, the truth is, the Christian teaching on, on moral absolutism implies that there is an authority above us that has the, the position, has the, in, in, in law, the locus standi, um, to tell us or to define morality for us. We accept that because the truth is, if you take moral absolutism out of the equation, then what you have left is chaos. How, for example, could you have FIFA World Cup <laughs> if all the countries have their own laws regarding how the game is to be played? Yeah. Right? If there is no overarching absolute standards that say 
what a referee can call as a foul, mm -hmm. then you have chaos. You could never have a World Cup. Because each country would be saying, oh, no, 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 it's okay for one guy to punch the other one in his nose if he kicks the ball and it, and it, and it, and it scores it. Go. You cannot have that. So the Christian sees God as the source of morality, and we call that absolutism, moral absolutism. And therefore, when you go to Exodus chapter 20, for example, it, it opens by saying, I am the Lord thy God. The, here we have the personal intro of the one who is positioned to say what morality is. And he goes on to itemize or to catalog some moral principles that ought to guide humanity. right? And these are the, 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 um, the, the existential codes that, that define for us what is good and what is bad, behaviorally speaking. So Exodus 21 to 11, I mean the whole chapter, unpacks for us the, the Ten Commandments. And so as Christians, we believe that there is a cataclysmic clash between relativism and moral absolutism. They cannot be roommates. They are like light and darkness. Okay. Go ahead, Pastor Gordon. Yes. Um, to me, the Bible is very interesting, eh? and uh, it, showed, it shows both sides of God. Um, on one hand, we see God as the commander who dictates what he wants or what is right, what is absolute. And uh, on the other hand, we see God as negotiator, where God is willing to um, negotiate with human beings. He's willing to um, adapt. He's willing to, to be flexible. Uh, because the, the experience with Sodom and Gomorrah is a, a chief example, where God declared, hey, I'm going to destroy everything, everybody. Um, but here came um, Lot and he interceded. If you find 50, if you find 40, come right down to 10. And uh, one would have said, um, did God change his mind? Many times God said, I'm going to wipe out the Israelites. But then they repented and God gave them a second chance. Mm -hmm. So there are some things that God does not mess around with. It's absolute. That's it. Principles, character, doctrines. Um, these are the, the foundational pillars of our faith. But in terms of our character and dealing with human beings, um, the fact that someone is merciful and gracious means that there must be some sort of relativism in how they deal with the individual. Because if God dealt with all of humanity strictly based on the law, since Adam and Eve compromised, that's it. You know? That's so, so Jesus coming to earth is actually... An intervention against God's absolutism. Because one sin entered based on the law, strictly by the law. No, it's like a police officer stop you for a smooth tire. The law says you should be charged, but he might say, I've given you one hour. Go to the quick, the nearest tire shop. You obey, you use the grace, and I would not give you a ticket. And it's just like if all of us ask ourselves the question, he who disobeys shall die, but we are here living. All of us have willingly disobeyed at least one point in time in our lives. But because of God's grace, we are still here. So I, I see the two sides of God's character, you know, in the Bible. When you look at it holistically. Okay. Well, I, 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 want ahead, to, I want to add, um, as, as Jamie was talking, I, I was smiling because I was for a moment having some definitional issues. <laughs> <laughs> because I... I I, I agree with Jamie in principle, really. Pastor Gordon was saying, I, I don't disagree with his, his, his argument. It's just some things I probably would have would defined them a different way. For example, he spoke very eloquently about the application of God's mercy. And I'm in total agreement with him. But the, I just want to state that the way how I see it is that the application of mercy or the, the exercising of the prerogative of mercy does not obviate the perpetuity of the law or the standard. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you take the, 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 the beautiful illustration Pastor Jamie Gordon just gave about the policeman by the side of the road, so the, you, you have a smooth tire or you, you, you have a cracked windscreen or something, or you were speeding beyond the limit, mm -hmm. it means 
that there is a standard that says that defines how you are to operate your motor vehicle yeah when the policeman pulls you up that's justice that is applying the absolute moral principle but then the policeman has built into his job the capacity for the exercise of discretion and grace okay. but the exercise of discretion and grace does not mean the cancellation of the law under which he pulled you over yeah so god may exercise mercy and may not give you the consequences you deserve he may suspend it you raise of sin is death but and as pastor Gordon said you're still alive because he has a he has not given you what you deserve at the moment that he might extend grace to you. But even in his not giving you what you deserve must not be perceived to mean that he has changed his mind yes, about what caused you to sin in the first place. No, correct, right, correct, nice. correct. And what I would say is that relativism does not trump the principle of God's love. Amen, amen. I would say amen. that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know, Pastor, on that point, eh? Going through the questions, eh, it, it just reminded me as human beings how humble we have to be eh, in terms of trying to understand God. Because look at Oza with the ark. Instant death. Eh? He would have warned other persons, don't do that. And he gave them grace. And one would say, God instructed, don't kill. But then he ordered persons to kill. And if you try to make sense of all that humanly, you may end at a human conclusion that is wrong. So just like Job said, cans thou by searching, find out God. So we in our understanding of God should not be absolute. Because if we think we have it down pack, <laughs> it's sort of disqualifying ourselves from understanding God. I, I don't know if I make... So we cannot say God did that so, then it's um, across the board. Because God in another book acts differently. And I say, well, how we did that here? And then he... So the whole issue to me is a, a humbling one. It's like, boy... It's a journey to understand God. It's a process, you know. I'm in total agreement with that. And that is why, Pastor Jamie and Master Moderator, we really must exercise intellectual humility when we're yeah. dealing with the things of God because yeah. you cannot fit him, not even, Pastor Jamie, in our logical structures. True. We have True. beautiful, for example, syllogisms that we can use to arrive at truth philosophically. But even then, when you put God in the equation, you have to humble yourself. Because <laughs> even your true. syllogisms break yeah. down when you're dealing with God. All right. yeah. and, and that's what I'm saying also in terms of relativism and uh, Christianity. If one does not accept Christ mm -hmm. and uh, biblical teachings, the principles of God's word, then our discussion today is null and void mm -hmm. in their minds mm -hmm. because they have a different perspective on what we are presenting. And so the acceptance of Christ mm -hmm. is important yeah. for the acceptance of what is being offered today. Amen. That's just a simple reality, Pastor Jerome God. <laughs> amen, amen. Amen, All Pastor. Right. <laughs> All right, so at this time we're going to pause and take a special item of music and then we return on the whole aspect of relativism. Amen. I, that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind still you. Hear me when I'm calling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours, I am yours. Who am I that the eyes have seen my sin would look on me with love? 
and watch me rise again. Who am I that the voice that calm the sea would call out to the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, yet today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind still you. Hear me when I'm calling, Lord you catch me when I'm falling. And you told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, yet today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours. We say welcome back to Pastor's Corner, and we are discussing relativism in Christendom. And if you missed it before, we have Pastor Jerome Gordon, and he's to my immediate left. And to the further end, we have Pastor Jamie Gordon, both serving as directors of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And we have been discussing that aspect of relativism, what is in your view, how you see life based on your culture, based on your context. And uh, as we move forward, we have question, this question that to me is important as we continue. And they will just give a synopsis as to what we would have done prior to the break. What are some of the popular doctrines of Christendom that seem to be influenced by ethical relativism? Well, as was pointed out earlier, Relativism is the whole idea that uh, right and wrong cannot be determined universally, that they are circumstantial, or they're, they're situational. So what's right for one man in one context may not be right for the other um, in, in his context. And to some extent, you know, pastors, we do have a little bit of relativism that we can accept. For example, in terms of dress, right? In certain culture, it's wrong to dress a certain way, right? And it has nothing to do with fundamental moral principles, but that's culturally how it is interpreted, how it is applied. They, they believe that a woman should be dressed a certain way. In one culture, she must never show her ankles because that is a sign that she's voluptuous and appealing and, you know, 
And so she, covered, she covers her anchors. So yes, there are certain cultural preferences that you go across the globe um, that, that, that are relative, that the right and wrong, relative in those con contexts. But when it comes on to universal principles like taught, I mean, being against torture and the suppression of free speech and uh, um, slavery, we believe that there are universal principles that criminalize or make those things wrong. It doesn't matter where you are in time or in space. So coming back to the question, are there some Christian doctrines? Well, there is a whole doctrine of love, Pastor Jamie, and there is the whole question of glossolalia, the tongue-speaking movement. There is a view there out there that says once you are, quote-unquote, filled with the Spirit, then anything you do is okay because you're, you're filled, you're under the anointing. And um, I take issue with that because I, I believe that a doctrine that says that all I need to do is to be filled with the Spirit, that doctrine is behaviorally inadequate. Uh, whole ethical relativism. Do we need to define this? Ethical relativism? Well, it's the same thing. Uh, to say relativism is just a shortened way of saying ethical relativism because ethics deal with what is right and what is wrong. So relativism or ethical relativism, re relativism is absolutely the same thing. <laughs> All right, very nice. Um, yeah, um, you know, Pastor, it's um, very amazing that some of the, the best minds from different denominations prayerfully would study the same scripture and we have a variety of interpretations. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the most startling ones I saw in recent times, um, there was a, a pastor, he was evangelical, but I don't know under what inspiration, and to him, he wrote off or ruled out the idea of God destroying persons in hell. So he was, his doctrine was on love. Basically, God is too loving to destroy his creation. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the, 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 the doctrine of heaven and hell, mm -hmm. um, some persons believe in purgatory, that there is this middle ground between heaven and hell. Um, some persons believe in the ultimate final destruction of Satan and sinners in that lake of fire. Some people believe that it will be instantaneous and one-off. Some people believe it will be ongoing, so forever you're born in. Um, some people believe that heaven is on earth. Um, some people believe that heaven is to come. Um, even when you look at the second coming, some believe in the secret rapture. Um, some believe that we, we're going to be caught up together with him in the clouds. Um, another one is on the law. Some people believe that the law is currently abolished and we are simply living under grace. Um, we believe as Protestants, um, Seventh-day Adventists, that the law of God is still uh, abiding, even though God applies grace. When we look at health, some religions think alcohol is good just in moderation. Um, we believe that we should abstain alcohol in all of its forms. Um, when you look at even now marriage, um, there are some religions that are taking it upon themselves to marry persons of the same gender. Um, we cry out against it. We believe that it's totally wrong. Um, some people believe, um, some people teach that God is in favor of polygamy because of some of the fact that some of the patriarchs had multiple wives, David, Solomon, Abraham, um, whereas some believe it is one man for one woman, and that's all in Christianity. So you see, there are many doctrines that, that have been affected or influenced by ethical relativism. All right, so are we saying that relativism is creating a challenge when it comes to our Christian doctrine? Simple. Mm -hmm. Are we yes. saying that? Absolutely, right. because you really, the truth is that unless you, you believe in moral absolutism, unless you believe that there is an overarching principle to guide every man in every culture and every situation, you can actually degenerate into chaos. Yep. Now, I sometimes wonder how do the ethical relativists regard Saddam Hussein and Adolf Hitler? in terms of condemning them at an international tribunal. People would say, well, the men in their own culture did what was right in their own sight, in their <laughs> own context. True. Why then would you pull them to justice? We pull them to justice because it doesn't matter what nonsense we say, relativistically speaking, we do know that there are overarching principles that govern human behavior. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe in another discussion, we'll probably have to go into the origin of 
that whole aspect of relativism and mm -hmm. that school of thought and yeah. where it came from and how it came into being and how it came to influence and affect Christian dom and some of the doctrines within the Christian context, maybe in the next discussion. So let's go on in question number five. In the Summon on the Mount, Jesus sets forth the overarching principles of the new kingdom. Can there be Christian relativists? Can there be Christian relativists based on what you would have mentioned? That sounds like asking, <laughs> can there be a Christian Satanist? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. the, uh, the, the absolute truth is that you can't be a relativist and be a Christian because as a Christian, you accept the teachings of Christ. And Christ, to a large extent, is exclusivist in his thinking. Okay. Look at Matthew, the, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard it was said of mm -hmm. others by by them of old time. But I say unto you, look at John 14, verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but that word by is from the Greek word dia, which could also be translated through. So he says, no man cometh unto the Father, but by me, uh, but through me. So as far as Christ is concerned, truth ultimately cannot be relativistic. True. Truth is fundamental and truth proceeds from him. He defines truth. So to say that you're a Christian, you accept the teachings of Christ, but you believe that it is sometimes right to do wrong or in a certain context you don't have to be biblical. That to me is mm -hmm. an oxymoron. The yeah. end justifies the means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go to question number six. Oh. Bis, you oh. want to weigh in yeah. on? Just a, a little, okay. um, I agree with all that was said concerning mm -hmm. truth. I, I, would, I think there is only room for relativity in the church in terms of approach. Um, for example, just yesterday, a pastor and myself, we were speaking, and uh, he was preaching a very deep word on Saturday. And uh, he was trying his best to get it, but the brethren were not getting it. So, and we were just discussing in one congregation, you can have a summon of depth and the people eat it up. In another congregation, you might have to simplify it further. So you must be relative in your approach. In one place, you might have a crusade. In another place, you would have a health fear. So how you approach sharing the gospel, I think that may be the only way we can vary in terms of our approach. But truth, non-compromising. Yeah. Right. So we, we are, the way we preach should have a dynamic relevance. Yes. Can't be fixated. Uh, any, yeah. any, we can't say that method is wrong or that method is right. Yeah. Because the method must be situationally appropriate. Yeah. Okay. But, but the same truth you're preaching. The same truth you're preaching. <laughs> so you nice. would not take a tent crusade to certain sections of the country. I mean, a tent in lands of people. A tent in certain places <laughs> might not work. All know? right, all right. Very but, nice. but, but a yeah. health fear. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. A, a nice kind of seminar kind of um, presentation may work. True. All right. So, all right. Within a certain context. All right. So, based on Second Peter 2.20, and the 21, is there room for theological relativism hmm. within Christianity? And let me just share that passage for you. It says, For if after they have escaped the poor oceans of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them we have that one yeah yeah that's um based on on second second peter 2 20 21 mm -hmm. i'll um, speak about theological relativism within christianity Okay, so um, the, again, <laughs> it seems to me that um, the Paul, the Apostle Peter, rather, mm -hmm. he's talking about uh, the the whole question of knowing the Lord, mm -hmm. right? And having known the Lord, if you now begin to imbibe some other doctrines that are theologically incongruous with the doctrines of the Lord, if you if you were, for example an atheist, or you were out there in the world where you were an agnostic, or you believe all kinds of philosophical stuff, and you gave that up to accept Jesus Christ and, and to find in him the, the fountain of truth. He's saying that if you leave that and go back to the, the emptiness of that which you left behind, 
then you are becoming like um, an animal going back to it, it, its vomit. And it would have been better if you did not know the truth in the first place mm -hmm. yeah. than to let go the truth to go back to the trash. Mm -hmm. All right. Very nice. Good interpretation. Th there is one passage I just wanted to share past. Um, mm -hmm. First Corinthians 13, 12. Mm -hmm. For now we see through a glass mm -hmm. darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even as also I am known. Mm -hmm. And um, quickly, my mind just ran to the development of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, how the truth evolved over time. And uh, picture if William Miller or the, the early Advent movement would have said, our truth at that time is absolute and we have no room for growth or expansion or, or learning, then we would have been stuck in even some wrong understanding of Scripture. So... While some of the, the basic things like the Ten Commandments, of course, absolute, they, they fix the unchanging. Um, but sometimes, even in the church, we see that our statements on things evolve as we get better understanding, as we understand the matter better. So I wouldn't use the word relativism per se, but open to growing knowledge. Like some of the statements we may have had before, how we address LGBTQ, Pastor God, and 10 years ago. How we address it now today, Pastor Lands, we will see changes based on the, the society is becoming more rampant, is becoming much more of a political topic. So I would say our understanding should have room for growth and, and development. All right. And yeah. I'm light, in total agreement light with of that. The joss, so, bright right. bright. so there is progressive and progressiveness and improvement in our understanding of teach of, of the teachings of scripture. Right. Amen. Very Amen. nice. And uh, how should we as uh, seven day Adventists engage in constructive dialogue and reflection on relativism while remaining rooted in our faith and the teachings of the Bible. Mm -hmm. I like the how. Mm -hmm. How should we engage in dialogue? And when I, when I reflected on this earlier, gentlemen, before the program began, the thought came to me that Jesus says we must go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Mm -hmm. We must preach to all men. And all men include the relativists. We have got to see folks who have divergent views yeah. as uh, people who Jesus died for, mm -hmm. people who he loves, and we must <laughs> love them too. And the best way to engage these folks is A, to have an understanding of your truth, B, to have an understanding of their truth, and to speak persuasively of your personal encounter with Jesus. Amen. Right. Amen. Very nice. We have two questions left. Two official questions left. Is relativism a danger to Christian values? If yes, what can we do to mitigate against it as believers? So is relativism a danger to Christian values? And what can we do to mm -hmm. mitigate against uh, it? Well, um, I'll just share about two or three quick points. Um, num number one, um, we should have the attitude of the Bereans who continued to study and search even after truth was presented. Mm -hmm. And I think within our church at Seventh-day Adventist, it's something that we promote. Um, we don't hide people from other people's churches or say don't go, but we must be exposed to things and be able to search it out and be convicted personally. So I would say that this spirit must exist within the church. Um, so even if a pastor preaches, a member should have the right to go home and fact check, read the Bible, read the spirit of prophecy quotations, compare it to ensure that you yourself are converted by, by what you would afford. Um, I would also say number two, the spirit of humility. Because um, if we don't have that spirit to at least be open-minded in some way or to be able to listen, then it means that learning automatically stops. And when you look at Christ, his approach, eh? he was in the rum shop. They call him wine bibber among prostitutes, all kind of name. But he knew his mission. He was, he was never shaky in terms of his rootedness. But in terms of how he did it, he was not afraid to even break the tradition at the time because he understood that his method was the one that would reach the people. Um, even when we look at um, Christ's method alone, um, the absolute came way down to the last. He mingled, he won the confidence, he showed them compassion, and then he shared the truth and said, come follow me. So I, I think that that kind of humble and approachable thing, it's, it's a good thing. You know, it's a, a very good thing. Even when Jesus went to the home of Zacchaeus, everybody vexed. What a man going home in the, in the home of a thief to do? But he understood what he was trying to do. And lastly, I don't know if you all would agree with me on that one, 
But I would also say that even as Seventh-day Adventists, being God's chosen, I believe that there are certain things that we can still learn from other denominations. It might not be truth, but it could be approach, it could be strategy. There can be other things. We, we must never get to the point to believe that we are self-sufficient in all aspects of church life. You know, I, I, would, I would say that also. And I would support you in saying that neither should we think we have a, a monopoly on holiness and Christian living. True. <laughs> because <laughs> there are people who are not of our faith, All right. who, are, who have surrendered their lives to Jesus. Amen. Amen. And the, the Bible refers to them in John 10, in my opinion, in verse 16, as the other sheep who are not of this fold. Yeah. And so the fact that they are not in your fold doesn't mean that they are going to hell. It means that Jesus is going to bring together all his people from wherever they are. Amen. He's going to gather them into the obedient Sabbath-keeping fold. Amen. And I, I want to add a little bit to the question, Pastor, when it says that what um, is relative, relativism a danger to Christian values. I would also like to add quickly that it's also a danger to the neighborhood. Because if, if Jamie <laughs> believes that he it's okay for him to kill his chickens and throw the heads over my fence because that's right for him, you know. <laughs> He's going to be a bad neighbor. Yeah. So the truth is that relativism is hard to live with. If you think it's okay to you to lust, sexually lust at children, mm -hmm. that's right for you. Well, that's wrong for me. And if I catch you ch touching my, my children, then I, 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 may, I may pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very nice. 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 And uh, our final question for our discussion today on relativism and the Christendom is what is the point of convergence between ethical relativism and the narrative of the LGBTQI movement? Mm. You got that? Yes, I, okay. indeed, I, I, got, I was just <laughs> reflecting right. on, on the, uh, the narrative of the LGBTQ mm -hmm. movement, Pastors Gordon and Lyons. It's very interesting mm -hmm. because when you think of the fact that it's an absolute biological truth, it's a biological truism that gender is binary. Now we've been told that gender is fluid. And I often say, but, you know, this cuts across the, the, the <laughs> overarching truth, not the opinionated position, but the overarching, overarching truth. And let me be quick. How do we get babies? How many genders do, does it require? Five to get a baby? Well, each person produces a, a haploid, not, uh, not a diploid, a haploid. Um, and it takes two haploids. It takes a, an, a, a, a haploid XY and a, another haploid XX to produce the zygote. But then we are now being told that, um, listen, gender is fluid, family must be redefined, sexuality must be redefined, and all these things must be redefined. So now, what is a man? It's hard to say. What is a woman? It's hard to say in the context of the LGBTQ narrative. And I believe that we need to see that that is relativistic in nature because it is saying that something, I can be a man in my own context and my own hmm. definition of what is a man. <laughs> and I have a problem with that. I love them. Yeah. I love all LGBTQ people. Don't promote violence against them, but <laughs> I disagree. You know, Pastor Lies, I got a joke, eh? Just thinking about the first text we read, eh? First Corinthians 9, eh? 19 to 23. If Paul were living in the LGBTQ time, do you think Paul would have said, and to the LGBTQ, I became as the LGBTQ to win? Them. And it's like, I'm just trying to contextualize, like, you know, based on what he was going through at the time, and like we ourselves know. And, um, you know, in the recent times, eh, like the word they become and putting yourself in somebody, somebody's position, and I've realized that there are different categories of people struggling or in the LGBTQ movement, there are some who are just disrespectful to God. There are some who are biologically challenged. And there are some who are like educationally challenged. For example, growing up now and in a couple of years from now, as part of the curriculum would be 
um, shown clear that you have a choice to choose either your he, she, it, they, them, what, what, whatever. That, that would be like normal and natural. So some people would naturally grow up in that school of thought, seeing it as, okay, I have a choice. There are some persons who are biologically challenged. And that is one that kind of got me. Like there were people who, who are actually born with two genitals. And none is necessarily more dominant than the other. There are rare cases though. And they literally, and they have to make a choice. Okay, I have to choose if I'm going to identify as a man or a woman. They might, they might not even be able to make children. And um, these are the rare conditions. So in cases like that as a church, we have to be sympathetic and also see it as a consequence of sin is that the human body, some maybe sort of, I don't want to say disfigured, you know, but they might not be the ideal way. And we have to be very sensitive how we treat a person like that. And there is the other class who knows willfully and willingly what God expects, but they just don't care. So as a church, in preaching the same message to these three different groups of people, it's like we have to be, just like Paul, adaptable. Would you go and preach to someone who we may call um, a hermaphrodite, that you're going in hell? Or you? We have to understand what is the struggle like. Um, if they come to us for guidance, well, pastor, which one do I choose, male or female? You know, we had to be real under inspiration to guide that person, eh? And I was looking at a documentary that a young, it's like a young lady, young man in one. And it's like when she was younger, she was like more dominant as a boy. And as she grew older, she started to grow like a breast, but she had like a mini penis. So it's like a, a mixture. <laughs> so it's like, you know, only God could really help us in these situations, you know? I, I think in terms of, as was mentioned before, the, the evolution of defini definition. Yeah. And uh, how we acclimatize ourselves to accept the way persons view life and how they view themselves and what they think is acceptable relativism is creating that challenge and we see that clash or rather the convergence in terms of the LGBT and uh, the whole concept of relativism because mm -hmm. it is a, a mind aspect. It's, it's more than body because you can change body but the mind, if the mind is not changed, so as, as much as persons, their thinking seem to be evolving and being hmm. transformed by the experiences of different cultures and the way they see life, yeah. then we see in greater challenges coming. That is why we must stand on principle. principle yeah. And of course, it cannot go away from the principle of God's word. That's Amen. fundamental. Amen. All right, gentlemen. Wonderful discussion today. Reality is, it's time to close. <laughs> well, final thoughts. Um, my final thought would be, it is imperative that we understand ethical relativism because if you go to any non-Christian university, you're going to run into it. Uh, the society is changing. Long, long ago, when I was a boy, everybody was um, absolutist in their thinking. Everybody believed in God in my village where I grew up. But today, it's different. The, no longer can we say, I'm going across to, to the foreign lands uh, to find the heathen, the pagan who don't believe the things. Right in your backyard, in your neighborhood. Yeah. There's a time when missionaries would leave the U.S. to go other places. To now, you have people groups all around you, and they have different ethical systems. So as a Christian, we need to educate ourselves on the various positions out there and try your best in a non-confrontational, non-adversarial, non-judgmental way to teach the love of Jesus to those who don't believe what we believe. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, my closing thoughts, I would just um, say that, let's remember that Satan's main weapon is that of ethical relativism. Just like in the Garden of Eden, you shall not surely die. And that's the reason we are in the situation we are today. So it's always good to be absolute in our thinking and in our faith, the things that guide us. I think they, they would keep us on the streets and narrow paths. They may be challenging at times, but absolute is usually and always the safest way. All right. Well, today is Alicia Stevens' birthday. We want to say happy birthday to you. And I know that Pastor Jerome Gordon would wouldn't mind singing one verse, one stanza of happy, bu happy birthday to you. <laughs> so, Pastor Gordon, you could go ahead. I have always thought he was my friend, you know. <laughs> but now, all right. no, no, no. Well, I, 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 I no longer believe he's my friend at let's all. Do, let's do one verse. Let's do one, one line for her, I, I, at least. Among the three of us, I think he's the singer, you know. Yes, well, Pastor, go others. ahead. Pastor, <laughs> Pastor, go ahead. All right, let's, let's try and get a good key. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Alicia. Happy birthday to you. All right, very nice. So happy happy birthday. birthday, my dear. And to all those other persons who may be celebrating today, we say happy birthday to you. Amen. She has been a long standing viewer, and we recognize <laughs> her, her viewing and her, her interaction. All right, so Pastor God, sure. would do the closing prayer for us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this platform and this opportunity to share your truth. We know that the day is coming when uh, our platforms will be censored uh, maybe even destroyed but while we have the safety and the room and the space we give you glory oh god to be able to sound the trumpet today god we want to pray for us as leaders in a very special way that will not be compromising like eli or eli's sons but i pray that we'll be able to stand for principle and not just stand and enforce it on others but to live by it as well god we know that the human bone it has a tendency oh god to wander um, for all of us, we have an affinity for sin in one way or the other. And I pray that you would forgive us of our sins. We pray that the scales would fall from our eyes like Saul did when he was transformed to Paul. And I pray, oh God, that we'll fall in love with you and your principles all over again. We lift up our members, our youth, um, persons who have not yet surrendered their life to Christ. We know that Satan is wreaking havoc by introducing you know relativism in the minds of persons you can live all you want and one of the commandments of satan is do as thou wilt and we know that when persons just do according to the women fancy it's a sure roller coaster ride to hell and destruction we pray that will also be approachable loving in sharing the truth and enforcing it as well and i pray that by living sharing and modeling christ we pray that the world will be exposed to your truth we want to pray that you'd preserve this platform, continue to expand it as much as is possible. And those who would have looked on today, those who would look at the rebroadcast later on tonight, we pray that a blessing will be upon all those of us. Thank you, God, for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and have a wonderful day.